Hello, I'm Frank Stritter, and today I have uh, another presentation on the unsung heroes of World War II. Uh, this time, our topic is the Tuskegee Airmen. I want to start today with a true false question. African American pilots flew in combat during World War I. True or false? Have you got it? Okay, the answer is both true and false. No African American pilots actually flew for the U.S. Army Air Service during World War I. But Eugene Ballard, and you can see him here in the photograph, who was an African-American from Georgia, flew a fighter plane for the French Air Service from 1916 to 1917. So you can have it both ways. It was not until World War II that African-American flew in combat for the US. In this presentation, I'm going to discuss the first such military unit of African-American pilots, the Tuskegee Airmen. And the individual who commanded that first unit, the 99th Fighter Squadron, General Benjamin O. Davis, Jr. The 16 million men and women who served in the US Armed Forces during World War II included more than one and a half million African-Americans. However, all members of the US military, as members of the US military, those African-Americans encountered unequal treatment and limited opportunities for promotion and transfer due to the racial segregation practiced by the military, as well as the entire nation at that time. As a sad reflection of the times, a War Department study in 1925 stated that Negroes did not have the intelligence, the character, or the leadership skills to serve in combat units and particularly not in Army Air Corps units. The 1940 United States Selective Service and Training Act outlawed racial discrimination but African Americans were still not <clears throat> were still accepted for the military only if openings in units and training facilities specifically designated for their racial category existed. Since most US military bases did not have additional segregated facilities such as housing only half of the nation, African American volunteers and draftees were inducted into the military at that time. Those who were inducted were usually assigned to large units whose members represented a wide range of skills and levels of formal education. All of them were made to work separately from white soldiers, received medical treatment from separate blood banks, hospitals and medical staff, and socialized only in segregated settings. If they left their bases, they usually experienced hostility from local white civilian communities. In 1912, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., the first African-American to command an Air Corps unit, was born in Washington, D.C. to General Benjamin O. Davis Sr., the first African-American general in the U.S. Army. Davis Sr. had served with the 9th Cavalry one of the original Buffalo Soldier units of segregated African-American troops. He qualified for his commission while in the 9th, and then served in various army capacities until his retirement in 1948. In 1936, Davis Jr. attended and graduated from the United States Military Academy. He was the fourth African-American to graduate, the first in the 20th century, and with a rank of 35 in a class of 275. His four years at the academy were not pleasant. 
Because he was African-American, he was officially silenced by all other cadets. This means that no one spoke to him for his four years there except on official business. He roomed alone and he had no friends. Interestingly, one of his classmates was General William Westmoreland, commander of US forces in Vietnam from 1964 to 1968 from whom Davis received no better treatment than from his other classmates. Davis had applied for assignment to the Air Corps while at West Point, but was rejected and told that there were no places for African-Americans in the Air Corps. To avoid the situation in which a black man commanded whites, something the army considered untenable, Davis was instead assigned to the, an all black service unit 24th Infantry Regiment at Fort Benning. There, he was not even allowed into the base officers club. He would regard that snub as one of the greatest insults in his 37 years of military life. African Americans had applied to be aviators during World War I, but all were rejected, largely due to the racial prejudice prevalent at that time. In 1939, the NAACP and several newspapers began to lobby the War Department and the Roosevelt administration to accept Blacks in pilot training. Even then, the Air Corps remained opposed to admitting Black recruits. But in 1940, Republican presidential candidate William, correction, Wendell Wilkie promised to desegregate the military, motivating his opponent, then President Franklin D. Roosevelt, to authorize the enlistment of African-American pilots. This was one among other modest civil rights concessions aimed at keeping the African-American vote. On 16 January 1941, the president announced that an all African-American fighter plane unit would be created at the historically African-American Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. In 1940, Davis happened to be assigned to teach the ROTC curriculum at Tuskegee. In 1941, it was heard, unheard of that African-Americans could be a military pilot before the Tuskegee Airmen appeared on the scene. But then on 19 March, the Army Air Corps established the segregated 99th Pursuit Squadron and an experimental training program to supply pilots for it at Tuskegee. Early in 1941, before the first cadets even arrived, the program got a publicity boost when First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt was taken up in a plane by C.A. Anderson, an African-American aviation pioneer who was Tuskegee's chief flight instructor. Nevertheless, many top military officials, including the Secretary of the War Department, not surprisingly, expected the Tuskegee experiment to fail. Later in 1941, Tuskegee's first class of 13 pilots began the training program with five, five of the 13 successfully completing the challenging training program nine months later. Davis still wanted to fly applied for, was accepted, assigned to that training class, completed it successfully, and became a Tuskegee Airman. In 1942, he became the first African-American to solo in an Army Air Corps plane. Having been promoted to Lieutenant Colonel six months shy of his 30th birthday, Davis was assigned command of Tuskegee's 99th Fighter Squadron, the first unit of Tuskegee Airmen. In early 1943, Davis took the 99th to North Africa and then later to Sicily where it flew P-40 Warhawk fighters in combat from April 1943 into July 1944. And later in 1943, Davis was recalled to the States to assume command of the 332nd Fighter Group, a new unit of Tuskegee Airmen preparing for combat in Europe. Davis moved the 332nd 
to Italy in February 1944. The 99th Fighter Squadron that was already there was soon integrated into the 332nd Group. And for those of you who don't know the organization, uh, there are several squadrons in a group. So this was a larger assignment for Davis. Uh, the 332nd was initially assigned to the 12th Air Force flying P-39s in es to escort convoys, protect harbors, and fly armed reconnaissance missions. The group converted to P-47s early in 1944 and then to P-51 Mustangs in June of that year. The group was reassigned to the 15th Air Force from May 1944 to April 1945, primarily to protect bombers attacking oil refineries, factories, airfields, and marshaling yards. The Tuskegee Airmen's combat record did much to quiet the misgivings of those directly involved with the group, notably the bomber crews of the 15th Air Force who experienced what the Tuskegee Airmen could do and then requested them specifically for as their escorts, calling them the red-tailed angels. As a matter of fact, you may have seen the movie called the red-tailed angels. The Tuskegee Airmen were credited with the following impressive accomplishments. 992 pilots successfully trained at Tuskegee from 1944 to 1946. 450 of them deployed to Europe and 84 lost their lives in accidents or in combat. They flew 15,000 sorties, 1,578 combat missions, 179 bomber escort missions, losing bombers on only seven of those missions a total of only 27 bombers. Now this compared to an average of 46 bombers among other Air Force fighter escort groups in Europe. So it's a pretty good comparison. They destroyed 112 enemy aircraft in the air, another 450 more on the ground and 400, 148 damaged for a total of 410. They destroyed 950 rail cars, trucks, and other motor vehicles, and 40 boats and barges. Quite a record. As the leader of 60 missions himself, Davis was awarded the Silver Star and the Distinguished Flying Cross. Davis believed that the accomplishments of the 332nd had demonstrated the capabilities of black aviators to the country and further undermined the segregationist policies prevalent in the military. In 1948, segregation officially ended in the military with an executive order signed by President Harry Truman. Davis was recalled to the Pentagon to work on drafting the Air Force plan for implementing the order and then facilitating its implementation. The Air Force was the first of the services to integrate fully, but Davis reported the process proved to be very difficult. He believed, however, that the Air Force became a much more effective organization because of it. In 1949, Davis was selected to attend the Air War College. Before he did so, no African-American officer in any service had ever attended the War College as discrimination had barred their attendance. Even while attending the Air War College in Montgomery, Alabama, Davis and his wife, Agatha, were not allowed by locals to eat in most area restaurants. In early 1953, Davis was sent back to the Pentagon for a short time, where he helped to organize the Air Force demonstration team that became known as the Thunderbirds. In later 1953, the Air Force assigned Davis command of the 51st Fighter Interceptor Wing in Korea. There, he flew the F-86 Sabredreth and successfully supervised a wing of thousands of airmen, almost all white. 
1954, Davis was transferred to Japan, where he served as Director of Operations and Training for the Far East Air Forces. Three months later, he was promoted to Brigadier General, the second African-American general in the US military, the first being his father, and the first in the Air Force. He was then transferred to the Philippines as both Vice Commander of 13th Air Force and Commander of Air Task Force 13 in Taiwan, China. There he built a defensive air force to deter communist forces on mainland China from launching attacks on Taiwan, a major undertaking. In 1957, Davis was assigned to be Chief of Staff of 12th Air Force in Europe. He then returned to the United States where he, we held, where he held various task positions until 1967, when he was assigned command of 13th Air Force. That included more than 55,000 servicemen all over Asia, including many thousands who were flying in the Vietnam conflict. He held this post through 1958. His last assignment was at MacDill Air Force Base as Deputy Commander of Strike Command with additional duty as Commander-in-Chief of Middle East, South East, Southern Asia, and the African regions. In his autobiography, Davis commented that although he looked forward to both the assignment at MacDill and to seeing old friends again there, neither he nor his wife looked forward to living in the South again. And as assignments overseas, they had both experienced freedom, equality, and friendship, qualities of life that were often missing in his assignments in the United States. Even in the late 1960s, Davis, one of the highest ranking generals in the US military, continued to experience discrimination. In 1970, Davis retired having served more than 33 years in positions all over the world. He had excelled in every position and he left the Air Force and the military a much better place than he found it. In 1998, at the time of his retirement in 1970, Davis held the rank of Lieutenant General, that's a three star, but President Clinton awarded him a four star in retirement, increasing his rank to four stars and a full general. In 2002, Davis died at age 89. At his funeral, President Clinton said, General Davis was the living proof that a person can overcome adversity and discrimination, achieve great things, turn skeptics into believers, and through example, demonstrate that through perseverance, one person can bring about truly extraordinary change. He was buried at Arlington National Cemetery as a red-tailed P-51 Mustang, just like the one he had flown with a 332nd during World War II flew overhead. In 2007, the Tuskegee Airmen as a group were awarded the Congressional Gold Medal by President Bush. Lieutenant Colonel Charles Dryden, 86, one of the airmen, expressed mixed feelings at, the at that time, but the honor came so long after the war ended and that many of his comrades had died without knowing that Americans appreciated their service. General Davis, the airman's first commander, would have loved to have been at the ceremony. Davis was an aviation pioneer and the most famous Tuskegee Airmen. His military career spanned five decades and three wars. He was one of the first Tuskegee Airmen and the first African-American officer in the Army Air Corps. None of his personal achievements meant as much to Davis, however, as the one that brought about integration of the US Air Force always a patriot despite the discrimination he had suffered, Davis titled his 1991 memoir simply, Benjamin O. Davis, American. In that memoir, he wrote, the privileges of being an American belong to those brave enough to fight for them. 
thank you, General Davis, for fighting. I thank you all for watching today. I hope you'll tune in again when we have our next presentation on unsung heroes of World War II.